Okay, I think it's about time to get started. Um, <laughs> I noticed that this number, 55, is much lower than this number, 142. So we're gonna have to like turn up the gas a little bit uh, and really move through this. Um, yeah, we're supposed to be a lot later. There's a lot of questions. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> rules. So a rule is a kind of parser, a rule is a parser, but it has some other features added to it that um, mean that you can use it for things that most parsers can't be used for. And like I said before, the way to think of a rule, like the, the, the high level context is, a rule is a unit of work in your uh, larger parser, okay? So the way a rule works is like this. You have a tag type associated with the rule, okay? That is part of the type of the rule. And then all it does to do parsing is like most parsers have, you know, sub parsers in them or something. It doesn't know about the sub parsers. All it knows is I call this function called parse rule and I give it the tag type as the first parameter. It's actually a pointer to the tag type, but that's a detail, right? If I give it that tag type, someone better have implemented that parse rule and it, that's how it is going to do its real work. Okay. The reason that's important is because that's essentially like a forward declaration of some work to be done later. Right? Just like you forward declare a function. This lets us have rules that refer to each other in a way that, that breaks cycles. <clears throat> you don't need to find parse rule yourself. There's a macro for that. You can write it out yourself. Just use the macro. Okay, so let's look at an actual example of a rule in use. So here we've got the rule itself, boost parser rule. Okay, It's got the uh, <clears throat> declaration right there in line of this tag, ints tag, and the 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 name of the rule itself, the rule variable is called ints. We also provide the attribute type right here. If you leave off the attribute type, the attribute type is none, okay? Then we give it this nice bit of diagnostic text. So if this comes up on the, the business end of an expectation point and it fails, that's the thing that we're gonna print out. And we'll see the diagnostics and why this is important later on. But it's really nice instead of like in, uh, in all the spirit examples, this was generally just like a name of this thing. So this would be like quote ints usually in the examples. But I find it's really nice to actually spell out what this thing is in user-friendly text so that when you get the diagnostic, it says something that users are gonna wanna read. <clears throat> so then we define this actual parser here with real parsing logic in it. Remember, this is just like a tag type that knows how to be used uh, to call some function. This is some logic to be used in that function. We still haven't defined the function yet. Okay, this is a naming convention we use to associate ints with the actual parse definition, where you call it ints um, suffix underscore def. And then we use this um, variadic macro right here. You can list any number of rules here and it will uh, make a parser rule that has the tag type out of this rule that you named, right? So in this case, it would be ints tag. And then it will use the ints def uh, inside that implementation. Now, the reason there's two overloads of parse rule is that one of them returns the value type, one of them fills in the value, just like we saw with individual parsers, okay? So it's gonna <clears throat> token paste the underscore def onto, no, it's- That's right, that's exactly what it does, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we, we defined ints without referring to any of the parsing logic, and that's, like I said before, uh, a nice, benefit because that gives us kind of this forward declaration uh, semantic. Um, and so that means we can make a rule that is recursive on itself. We can also make rules that are mutually recursive sets of rules that refer to each other over and over again. Uh, there's other reasons to write rules though. Um, so <clears throat> if you want to fix the attribute type used by a parser. Now we've seen over and over again how we have this loose matching, right? I can give you an out argument that's different from the generated attribute type. If we wanna specify, no, it must be this exact attribute type and nothing else, we can do that with a rule, right? That's one of the things rules are useful for. If we wanna make something that produces nice diagnostic text, this is the way we hang some kind of text like we saw before off of uh, a bit of uh, parsing logic is via rule. <clears throat> and then, like I said before, we get these recursive things. And there's also something uh, called callback parsing. That is where instead of producing an attribute either as an out uh, parameter uh, filled in or producing it as a return value, we call um, some callback with the tag type and the attribute that we just generated. Okay, so this lets us take everything we've seen so far as like a DOM parser. You can trivially turn any of these things into a SACS parser by using callback parsing. Okay, 
that has some nice benefits that we're going to talk about later. Besides just breaking up the work and making things fit in memory and the, like the usual reasons people do SACS parsing, it's actually a really nice testing methodology to, to make things into kind of a SACS parser. Okay, <clears throat> so at base, you want to use these for organizational purposes, I think. That's, that's the number one thing. What I tend to do is I write a rule for some bit of work that kind of seems self-contained. I write unit test for it. I put it on a shelf, I pull it off the shelf and I want to use it again, right? Okay, so let's go back to our initial example. We're parsing common delim delimited uh, sequence of doubles. <coughs> so now, as we saw before, we can put a set of ints here and that will catch our vector of double individual values. Uh, we might get truncation, but that will work. And then this does not work because now we're using that ints rule that we just saw. And the ints rule produces exactly a stood vector of int. It does not produce a set of int. What it does is after the parse is finished, it tries to take whatever ints produced and assign it directly to this. It can't see through that call to um, parse rule and like destructure and go recursively into it. It's, it's, like a, it's like a firewall between one level of the parse and another level of the parse. That rule creates that firewall. So the type of attribute produced by the rule is always the type of attribute produced by that rule. There's no destructuring of any kind happening inside. Yeah. The parse rule functions, are those templates? or are they, they are templates, yes. Okay. In Spirit X3, they're non-templates, and so you can actually forward declare them and then have the implementation as a separate file. I felt that that was a nice to have, but the trade-off of features that I got by making it a template I felt was more important. So I lost that bit of, uh, that's a nicety from X3 that I didn't maintain. Okay, it's so. Move assigning. <clears throat> sorry, what? It's move assigning that? It's always move assigning the attributes, that's right, yeah. Okay. Is there a way around knowing, uh, so in, in your example now, in the second line, I have to know that in, no, no. Oh, on that well, this, one, is, uh, this is the Spirit X3 stuff. Ah, so. but, but also in, oh, your, okay. in your example, uh, you, you had to know the, the type produced by the rule in advance. Yeah, yeah. Is there a way around it? Uh, no, I mean, you have to know the, the type of uh, function signature to forward declare a function. It's the same issue, no, right? Uh, but yeah. I, I guess there would be, right? Like, it doesn't just go one slide up. Uh, yeah. Um, a two. Uh, yeah, okay. actually, two. Two? Okay. Uh, the, the definition one on more. the rule, sorry. <laughs> that, that was... Oh, just, I, I yeah, just one slide up. No, that's yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only important slide. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so if you switched ints def and ints, right, you could put, yeah. on, instead of the stud vector int, you could put <laughs> like a the, meta function. Exactly, and, yeah. And, and that would work. Yeah, yeah that yeah, would yeah. be cool. Because right. sometimes you write like a complicated parser down there and you don't care about yeah. what type you get. And there's actually, put it in. There's, a spirit, uh, there's a spirit syntax for this where you do like percent equals yeah. and that says like, oh, just take the attribute type from the this, right? Yeah. But because we have this way, like rules are not like, but in spirit, X, uh, spirit two rather, um, rules are these type erase things. And now we've got this separation where, yeah. where we have a firewall between them. So like you said, you could invert the order and then use a meta function to determine that. And there's a meta function that will give the attribute okay. type. Yeah. I'm trying uh, to figure out how I could reserve that, uh, reserve the storage in that vector. Uh, yeah, for that case, um, what you would do is you would write an EPS parser at the beginning mm -hmm. and you would put a semantic action on it. And inside the semantic action you would say, um, val of context dot reserve whatever. Oh, you could do exactly that. Yeah. Okay. So this is the thing that I was saying was the deal breaker for me with Spirit X three. Now we're going to talk about it. you have enough context to understand the deal breaker that I had. So Spirit X 3s rules are very similar, right? You have this uh, uh, inline declaration. You have the 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 attribute type because it's a non template. You can forward declare the function. There's only one overload. There's not two parse rule functions. There's just one. And then down here, you, you define um, that you were just got the type of the, the rule up here. Actually, you define the, the actual rule variable here and give it a name. And then you define the parsing logic and then you define the actual function. So all this stuff can live inside of, uh, well, I think this stuff can live inside of a separate TU. That's the idea here, okay? The reason this is problematic is that even though I wrote std vector int here, I can still give it at the top level at parse or at any place in the middle of my parse, I can give it a stood set of double. 
and it's fine. It's just like, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I, I, I'll do that. What I ran into was I had this really complicated YAML parse that I keep referring to. And sometime in the middle of that, I was doing something like, so imagine I had <clears throat> um, a sequence of doubles I was, uh, or a sequence of ints that I was parsing, okay? And then somewhere in the parse, I caught that in a set of ints. So all of a sudden they're sorted. And then somewhere that ended up going into another vector of ints. So I, I have my code that parses stuff in one order. <laughs> And then somewhere on the output side, I've got all of a sudden they're sorted. Who sorted this vector? I didn't sort that. Why did that happen, right? So I was getting these weird behaviors. I could not figure out what was going on. And the code wasn't ill-formed. That was the problem is that it was just faking the funk for all these things that shouldn't have been treated as the same, okay? So th that's the thing is I think the, f the fuzziness of the rules or so the fuzziness of the non-rule parsers and how you get the attributes out of them is vitally important in some use cases. But it's also vitally important that you be able to lock down the type and say, no, it's exactly this type. That's the thing that allows you to unit test them, put them on the shelf and use them again later because you know everything about them is consistent with the way you tested them and the way you use them later on. And X3 didn't give me that, and so that's why I couldn't use it, even though I really loved it up to that point. <clears throat> so as I said, there's no way to turn off that looseness, even if you use a rule. The fact that I wrote that uh, type explicitly means to me that I should uh, honor that in the code, right? So let's talk about higher order parsers. Um, th there's only a few of these, so we're gonna go through all of them. Um, so the simplest one is repeat. This is basically the claim of star, uh, but it's constrained to exactly n, okay? Uh, repeat min max is similar, except that you have min and max. Um, min means it has to match it, that many times or more, but no more than max. So it can match somewhere in the middle and, and that's fine. Um, what's the reasoning for the bracket syntax that doesn't mean semantic, semantic attribute in this case? So this is um, essentially the syntax from Spirit and Spirit X3 oh, okay. so that I'm just, okay. yeah, so I'm just kind of like, propagating that <laughs> semantic, right? Or that uh, convention. So repeat is still a, a real parser. Repeat, yeah. So interestingly, so like the claim of star operator, the plus operator, repeat n and repeat min max, they all produce a, a different parameterization of the same underlying parser. The repeat parser with the percent sign actually also does that. There's a special case for the percent uh, kind of mode. <clears throat> So if cond p, we already talked about this before. So condition is evaluated at the point where you enter the parser. And if condition is truthy, then we go ahead and use the parse. Otherwise, the whole thing fails. And of course, if this parser fails, then the whole thing also fails. This is exactly the same as if you wrote it this way. And when you write this code, this is the actual object that you get, right? Lots of transformations like that happen uh, in, the, in the library. So this is something that Ben and I were just talking about. You can have a switch. Parser. So what this does is <clears throat> it evaluates this um, operand here, um, argument rather, and then if it's equal to A, then it parses using P1. If it's equal to B, it parses using P2. Otherwise, the whole parse fails. So it's equivalent to this. Okay. Now, you might be wondering, like, what can I write for X and A and so Sorry, forth? Can I, can I, I just want to read that again. Yeah. Um, where's the X coming from? Uh, you're writing the X. Like that's X you fill in. So let me get to the next slide. It might make it make more sense. <clears throat> so, yeah, X is an expression. So you can write like a number there. You can write um, a lambda there. If the lambda has the same kind of shape as a semantic action, except that it has a return type, then it will say, oh, I can pass you a context object and I get back a value. So that must be what you meant. And it invokes the lambda. And the fact that you're using parens <clears throat> means it's not an X. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Right. So that, uh, I, I refer to that as resolution of that argument. Um, and so there is, a, there's like a concept for like, you know, what things have to look like to get evaluated in those contexts. So all of those um, arguments, X, A, and B, are each individually evaluated in that same way. Like if it's just a value or an expression that I can just see the value of, that's fine. If it's a callable that takes a context, then I use that instead. Is that, is that chainable? Uh, is it longer chainable? And do you have a default case at the end? There's no default. If you don't match one of them, then it just doesn't know what to do. I but could add a default, but, but yeah, like you, I have print B, I could put C, yeah, D, okay. E, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah. the result type after you called the function call operator, I assume is the same type as before you put the function call operator, right? So if you added like another C comma P3, like that type is exactly the, the same. Otherwise, how would you chain things together? Is, is that right? The type of what is exactly the, the same the, as what? The, the result of like the expression switch underscore of X, blah, 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 like that entire line. Uh -huh. If you add another function call at the end of it, is the type of that expression the same as it was before? Uh, no. So like this is a variant of attribute type of P and attribute type of uh, P1 and P2, right? If I did C comma P3, then I would basically be doing the moral equivalent of bar EPS X equals C then P3. So then the type of this whole expression, the type of that whole expression would be a variant of the attribute types of P1, P2, and P3. So are you able to take the bottom long expression, surround that by parentheses, and then do a function call operator on that? Uh, no. Okay. No. This is special to the switch uh, okay. higher order parser. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I already explained that. Okay. So quoted string parser. So it, it turns out that pretty much every time you write any parser, you write this quoted string parser. So I decided like this should be a thing that it just does, okay? So <clears throat> if you write quoted string, that means I take open quote, any character is not a quote, close quote. I put all that in a Lexeme uh, directive, which we're gonna look at later. Lexeme turns off skipping. So that means that the, the white space that's inside your string ends up being part of your string. Obviously the uh, quotes are not included in the string and the, the uh, attribute type is string. You can change the delimiters. So the, sing, uh, the, the, the double quote is the default, but it could be like a bang or whatever you want to have on either end of your string. You can have a list of delimiters. So it's either single quote or double quote, but it has to be the same on both sides, right? So that would be like uh, the Python way of writing a string. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can also do the same thing, but then you can have, oh, I should have said that because a quote can't be in the string, you need a way of quoting a, uh, or uh, escaping a quote. So backslash quote inside of the string counts as a quote. And then immediately you need backslash backslash as well. Okay, so that's all included in these first three. This one, in addition to the backslash quote and backslash double backslash, it also says, um, I will take a symbol table and anytime I, anytime I see a backslash, if it's not followed by a backslash or the quote character, I'm gonna look in the symbol table and whatever it tells me, that's the thing that I'm gonna put in there. So if you put a T and then the actual backslash T character, that would be how you represented a tab in your inside your string, right? So this, this allows you to add stuff in your symbol parser. It occurred to me just today while I was here that I probably want another overload of this yes. that takes a character. And, and the character parser, because the one thing, so like when you look at a JSON parser, like there is a, a pretty complicated set of requirements on what a single character is inside of a quote, but otherwise the parser looks exactly like this one, but you can't use this for the JSON parser. So probably I want another overload that takes like uh, a char and then assembles or something like that. Uh, so that you can say like, I know what the character type looks like and I know how to delimit it. Just yeah. take a lambda and pass yeah. the character and, and, to it. And I would like to have one where, where I can put like an opening and an ending character, like, like, an, like a, a less, an opening and a, a greater as a closing. Yeah, but that's gotcha. generally, the, I mean, you're talking about a tag or something and you yeah. could re, you could fake it, but I mean, this is for like a quoted string. Like that is a very specific thing. And so this is tuned to that. And yeah. that's the thing is I write a quoted string parser every time I write a parser and I don't write a tag parser every time. So yeah. There could be an overload that allows you to override the backslash as the escape character. Yeah, I don't care about that, but yes, you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> so how does this parse the Unicode four digit uh, it, character it, escapes. it wouldn't and it doesn't. And okay. that's why I was saying like, if you had a character parser you could do that defaulted to char underscore. And instead of that, you could do something to handle escapes and so on. That would be the way you would make it work with like the JSON uh, right. coded string, for instance. Did yeah. you also have a question? It was the same question. Great, okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking about a Lambda there that takes the, char takes the character after the backslash. Uh, that is effectively what you've got here. Oh. Uh, but you've only but you've got a fixed set of them. Um, yeah. Well, it's like the lambda, right. yeah. the lambda would be more open ended for sure. But um, oh, I see. It compiles yeah. better with the fixed set. 
Yeah, and and uh, and it uses a try, so I don't think these are things that are going to be very long, but it's a very efficient way of literally look up and stuff. So okay, so this is where the break was supposed to be, so that's why I'm kind of moving faster. All right, so let's talk about directives. So we already talked about second order parsers. Directives are a form of second order parser, but they just have like a different uh, kind of semantic inside of uh, spirit. Like that's where the stuff all like kind of comes from. So think of a directive as something that influences the parse for some particular parser, okay? So in this case, we've got omit P, and what that does is it takes the parser P and it just does exactly what P does, except instead of generating an attribute, it turns off attribute generation inside there, and that's recursively. And in particular, it doesn't just like generate the attribute and then throw it on the floor, it turns it off. So you don't at actually allocate memory and do all that kind of stuff that you would have done if that was happening. Um, raw P gives you a subrange that matches the um, the character sequence matched by P, so it changes the <laughs> it changes wow. the attribute type to be just that subrange. Okay, it's like verify the grammar, but then give me the raw data. Exactly. So find the place where this match happened, and then give me the subrange. Now, what it does though is because the intention of raw is that you would use it inside the parse for different things. The type of iterator is the type of iterator that's used at the point of parse. It's not the iterator type that you gave me on the input side because that might be different. And when we talk about Unicode support, we'll talk about when that happens. But string view actually gives you the bottom type iterators. Okay, so string view is like raw, except that it gives you an actual string view. And it only works in C20 because that's the only time I can detect if you've got a contiguous range. And it only works for contiguous ranges, obviously. Um, but what it does is it looks through all the transcoding that might happen in the Unicode support layer. Again, later on, we'll get to that. And it finds the bottom type of the underlying sequence. So even if you gave it a transcoding range as input, if it can see underneath it, it's just a bunch of char 8Ts or char, char 16T or whatever it is, it's gonna give you a basic string view of that type, okay? Uh, <clears throat> no case, um, and this is actually, uh, Tobias, this is, he's responsible for this one because he was like, why don't you have no case? I'm like, I don't know, why don't I have that? I'll implement that. Um, so it just takes, again, recursively, all the, the parsers uh, from P and all its subparsers, and it turns off um, case sensitivity, right? So essentially it does the Unicode case folding algorithm on the input and on the values that are being matched inside of the various parsers under P, okay? <clears throat> Sorry, just verify my own. Um that algorithm is not language specific? It is not, it is not. So the way it works is it's different for different scripts, but um, with no loss of generality, let's say it makes everything uppercase, okay? And it works in every script that has cases. So within that script, it knows how to uppercase every single letter. Um, and so when you take the input, you're just doing a, a, a a lazy range inside the no case of like this thing that uppercases everything as it goes. And then let's say you've got a string parser you're matching. Well, a string parser has some string literal in it, let's say. And what you do is you just do exactly the same thing there and then you just do search. Yeah, right? I just it thought is. that uppercasing was somewhat language dependent. But I guess yeah, well it is, but there's tables for it in Unicode, right. yeah. So yeah. can that involve generating more than one character from a like you get yes. a lowercase and you can yes. generate like the Like the SN in yeah. German? Yeah, like, exactly, yeah. 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 <laughs> And that was that was actually in my test cases, yeah. and he mentioned it explicitly, so that the the SN was part of the the testing. Yeah, a lot to answer for. <laughs> yeah, so Lexeem is uh, how you disable Skipper. That's what I was talking about inside of a, a string parser, and that's usually the common use case. Is that I'm I'm capturing all the white space or something because I'm inside a context where now I care about it because inside a quoted string or something. And then the rest of the time, I don't care about it. And interestingly, you could have a skipper that not just skips white space, but also skips comments or something. And again, you probably want to turn that off inside of quotes. So this is disabling you know. a skipper that you've inherited from, from higher up. Exactly. So the okay. top level, you're providing the skipper. This is where you turn it off locally. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And then locally within that, you can turn the skipper back on because <laughs> sometimes your life is tough uh -huh. and you need to do things like this. Yeah. And then you can also provide a parameter to skipper, which is uh, to skip, which is a new skipper. So instead of turning on skip within a certain Lexeme context, you might want to just change the skipper for a certain subsequence to something else, right? Yeah. So now I'm really interested in how, if I were doing my own uh, basic parser, how do I detect what the skipper is in 
Um, but, but, but I, I, I think you can, that. yeah, I think you can actually get the skipper inside of a semantic action. I think there's a function for that, but. Um, Not a semantic action. Like if I was defining my own basic parser, like if I was defining a rule that was like, I have this weird thing. I have, you know, I have a parser from somewhere else that I just want to plug into this. Well, right. yeah, okay. So what you could do is if you didn't know, if you didn't have the global knowledge of what the skipper was, you could say, well, I'm going to assume a certain skipper and then I'm going to set that skipper using skip. And then I'm just going to use that inside my parse. And then you're overriding what the global thing is. So you don't have to care about it. And if that works inside that parse and you, you are able to write that standalone thing because of that uh, knowledge, then that might work for you. But I, otherwise you do need that global knowledge of like, I need to know what the other skipper is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is it part of the context, I guess? Uh, I think it is, and that's how you would get it as semantic right. action, because that's right. the only time you have a context, really. Right. Okay, so there's these other two directives that are like, so far, everything we've seen, all the operator overloads, all the directives, all the higher order parsers, they work on everything. Merge and its sibling um, separate do not. They only apply to sequence parsers, okay? Because they apply to the attribute generation rules in sequence parsers, which are a little funky. So, Remember before when I said, um, if we have a string followed by a string and that's a sequence, we don't jam them together and make one string out of it. This would do that. So if you wanted to make those two things one string, this is how you would spell that, okay? Um, and if you have two, or if you have, or so merge has to have like all the elements of the sequence have to have the same attribute type in order for it to work. And if the attribute type is some kind of sequence, then it just basically turns Every, um, every attribute generation into an append operation, okay? So we're just accumulating everything in one sequence. But if they're singleton values, like you've got an int followed by an int and you say merge, and the second one just overwrites the first one, okay? So merge behaves slightly differently for sequences versus singleton values. Okay. So, so it is truly join on the, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then separate, like I said, is it, it's, it's kind of its opposite. Um, and separate takes all the sub parsers and says, no, you're going to, you're going to occupy a different cell of the, the, uh, tuple, even if you would normally merge. So that example before we had the, the plus int followed by the int that where the int should have come at the beginning, this would make that have the different semantic. Okay. So a couple of examples. So <clears throat> this is the one that I just mentioned. I've got two strings. Presumably I'm, I'm doing white space and com comments kind of skipping in the middle there. And this produces uh, a tuple of two strings by default. But if I say merge, this could produce one string. And this, this seems kind of nonsensical. Why didn't I just write A, B, C, D, E, F? But the fact that I can do skipping in here does make, make that significant, right? Okay, so then this is the example I just referred to. Again, if I do separate, I get a tuple of vector and int instead of just one vector of int. Yes, it's still a bug on the same. It's still a bug in the same, it's same bug, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so now let's talk about Unicode support. So um, I should say up front, like, so I wrote a Unicode library. I gave a couple of talks about it here. And uh, I, uh, fortunately, <laughs> Eddie has taken up the papers for it, but I'm basically not working on it anymore. But I learned a bunch of stuff about Unicode in the process where I kind of like, I, I wanted to bring that knowledge to bear on this library in particular, because as I said at the outset of the first session, Spirit uh, 2 and X3, they both have robust Unicode support. We have to do a lot of work to get it like plugged in. They were all, they're both kind of bolted on. So what I wanted to do was make sure that everything was Unicode friendly all the time, but you still don't pay for what you don't use. So if you want to do ASCII parsing, you just do ASCII parsing. If you want to do Unicode, you just do Unicode and you don't have to like configure anything. You just feed stuff that looks like Unicode into the parser and now you're in Unicode land or you feed in stuff that doesn't look like Unicode and now you're in the non-Unicode land, okay? The non-Unicode land, you're doing matching on the subset of code points that are, you know, basically like less than 256. You don't care about all the ASCII, I mean, sorry, all the, the Unicode uh, versions of, of those same uh, things you're matching, okay? All right, so let's, let's look at some, uh, some more concrete information about this. Okay, so <clears throat> there's all the parse overloads, right? Like I mentioned, there's prefix parse and parse. Um, they all take a range of input, all right? That range of input has to be a sequence of character. All the character types are supported. Um, Probably the most controversial one is I do support WCHAR-T. So char is considered to be an I don't know for encoding, right? Because your char encoding 
is dependent on compiler flags and can be all kinds of stuff. It could be ASCII, it could be EBCDIC, it could be, could be all kinds of different things, okay? So it's not fair for us to say, well, char is obviously UTF-8, which is, it is on most Unices, right? But we can't depend on that. But char-8t, 16, and 32t, I'm just gonna call them char-nt for, for hereafter, uh, and wchart are meant to provide you overload space to opt into like Unicode representations. So even though we don't have any um, um, we don't have any invariance over those types either, the the thing is that they're used as ways to communicate that this is an alternate interface. So they're treated as if they're UTF-8, 16, or 32 respectively. Uh, chart uh, wchart is uh, assumed to be uh, 16 on Windows and 32 everywhere else. Okay. <clears throat> so. This is a 17 and, and 20 and later library. So we have to support the case where you don't even have char 8t. So there's no way for me to take my nice UTF-8 that's encoded into chars because I'm running on Unix and then that's where it, it is almost all the time. Like Mac, all Linux boxes these days are configured that way by default. You can configure them other ways, but the vast majority of users are just using char with UTF-8 in it. So for 17, you have a way of telling the, the um, the library, hey, I want to use the Unicode path. So there's this these uh, view adapters that I took from the Unicode library, and I just basically cut and pasted them into this library. So you can say as UTF n for any n, and it will say like, oh, I know what you mean. You're talking about this is a Unicode thingy, right? Because now the value type of that adapter is one of the char nts. Okay. So if it sees some kind of UTF then it immediately transcodes it to UTF-32 using uh, as UTF-32, which generates a UTF-32 view. Okay, obviously if the input is char, it doesn't do it, it, any of this stuff, okay? So what that means is that inside the library, I have a code path for char and a code path for char32t, and that's it. The only things that are ever parsed inside the library are those two types. Because either I don't know the encoding or I know it's, char, uh, it's a UTF-32 and that's a char32t. Um, so that implies that there's two code paths, right? But it's not like the whole library consists of two code paths. Most of the time, we just don't care about the difference between these two things, these two representations. But there are some parsers that need to know the difference. Okay, so for example, if I'm using the, uh, again, the string parser is a good example. So I give the string parser a string literal, okay? That string literal uh, is allowed to be a bunch of different things. I could pass it a, a char con star, I could pass it an array of char, I could pass it a, you know, big U string literal, which means an array of char 32T, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So what happens is inside the string parser, it sees that the input is char, and it says, oh, I'm just gonna take each char one at a time, and I'm gonna try to compare it to each element of that string I'm matching one at a time, and I'm gonna look for a mismatch. If I don't find a mismatch, we're a match. And the thing that I produce is the individual elements of that sequence that I was matching as a sequence of char, right? So if I'm parsing UTF-32 as the input, I know I'm in Unicode land, and now I know I need to take whatever that input was, whatever that string you gave to the string parser, and I need to transcode that to UTF-32. And I know I need to do that because you opted into Unicode by specifying one of the Unicode UTF formats on the input side. Only the parsers that care about that do that, and they know statically whether or not they need to do that because they know statically what the input type is, if it's a char or char 32T. So there's no branch, you don't pay for it. If you're in the ASCII path, you just never even see that code. Make sense? So when we do that comparison, again, in that example of like the string parser versus the input, we're doing each individual character comparison using just plain equality. We do a common type promotion um, to make sure we don't get a lot of spurious warnings, but it's just a quality comparison. So if I've got the big U string literal and I've got uh, you know an, an O with an umlaut over it, and then I've got like two inputs that are just in char and one's a, an O and one's the combining character for um, the, the umlaut, then I'm gonna see the O and I'm gonna compare it to the O with the umlaut and it doesn't work and we're done. But then if I had the input transcoded into a single code point, it would be the O with the umlaut compared to the O with the umlaut and it would compare the same, okay? And I think I have an example for just that, I sure do, except it's a circumflex, not an umlaut, right? So this does not match because this is a sequence of two characters 
an O and a combining character. This is assuming uh, you're running, a, you know, a typical like Linux GCC or, or Clang or something, right? So in that schema, your input is always considered to be UTF-8. If I put this here, that's going to be two code units, one code point, but they're treated as separate characters. So I compare the first one, which is just a plain O to that, doesn't match, I'm done, the parse fails. I do the same thing here, but now because the array is char 8t, I know that I need to take these two code units and transcode them and produce one code point that I'm that I'm um, processing for the, the whole parse is just parsing that one character and it happens to match the one character I'm looking for and so the parse uh, succeeds and it's a match. Does that make sense? Again, the idea is you wanna treat, in Unicode you wanna always treat everything as uh, code points as the, the basic unit of work. You never want to process individual code units. I even had some people pushing back against this in the boost review, which I found really odd. Um, but they were insisting that really you want to parse uh, where you're doing matching on code units all the time. And if your world is UTF-8, then you're always going to give UTF-8 matchers and UTF-8 input and it all just works. And that's fine, except that as soon as you then move to another platform and want to parse the uh, uh, WHRT on Windows UTF-16 or something, then all of a sudden you have to rewrite everything, right? So I like this better because it sort of automatically removes the impedance mismatch when we know we're in Unicode land, we know how to do those conversions, so we just we should just do them for the user. So what about the pre-combined characters that you can also make with combining sequences? Yeah, so um, it does not handle normalization, and so that is something I just can't get around. Um, there, there is a possibility that I could add like, you know, a parameter to um, to parse that says like, oh, we're, we're opting into a certain normalization scheme and so I'm gonna do on the fly normalization. That's a thing I could do. I haven't tried to do that. And, and part of the reason for that is that unlike I think mixing UTFs is, is, is not common, but it's a thing that people encounter a lot on Windows because almost everyone is, is recording or uh, 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 storing everything in UTF-8, but then all their sort of system adjacent stuff is in UTF-16. Whereas people tend to pick a, a normalization mode and then that's it. Like that's a normalization everywhere. That's not always the case, but it's a much less common impedance mismatch than UTFs. Yeah, so I, I hit that in Slovenian a lot because our we've got three Karen characters um, mm -hmm. that are in Windows 1, 2, Five, yeah, twelve fifty two. Yeah, and the normal transcoder doesn't treat them as combining characters, but all mm. text editors do, and so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you hit that. Yeah. So yeah, this is definitely like a potential pain point, and if I have people complaining about it enough, I might try to tackle the normalization part too. But um, so far, so good. We'll, we'll see. It might be a feature that gets added at some point. But yeah, that, that's a good point. That normalization is just ignored essentially. So we've talked about these character classes before. So like white space is all horizontal and vertical light, white space that includes line breaks and stuff. There's a bunch of like Unicode, um, like weird space characters and weird line break characters even. All that stuff is included. But inside the WS white space matcher, the inside that parser, um, I actually have an early branch that says, if this value is less than hex 100, <laughs> only match these code points because those are the ones that are in the sort of ASCII-ish land, right? And then if the value is anything else, then try to match everything else. And so what that means is that even if you use these things, which are totally robust and Unicode, um, you know, Unicode knowledgeable, even if you use them in ASCII parsers, all you're paying for is one extra branch over if they were strictly ASCII. And if there's something more branchy than parsing, I don't know what it is. So you're not going to notice that branch is the upshot, right? It's like not a big impact. Um, so I feel like this is a good way to, to structure things simply because people can write their, um, I actually had the, the thing from uh, Spirit 2 and X3, there was like an ASCII namespace and it had the versions of these things all for ASCII. But those things can be wrong because of locale, even for like ASCII. Right, like you can set the locale to something funky and they produce the wrong result even for ASCII. So I really wanted to make these 100% robust and make them as efficient as I could for the, for the ASCII side so you could just do ASCII parsing and, and be happy with it. And this gives you a migration path to very easily sort of upgrade your parser to Unicode if you want to and don't have to make a lot of changes. So. <clears throat>
And I said this before, but uh, we're using the case folding algorithm to do case insensitive matching. Um, so that's, uh, again, as robust as we can make it. Oh, and, and one thing I should point out here, like there's a lot of digits. <laughs> um, oh, you just think yeah. of like, yeah, you just yeah. think of like the Devin 10. Devangari digits. Yeah, Devangari is the one that's got all the, the you know, and, and so like, you know, Arabic has the same Arabic numerals we use in Latin, but they have different code points, right? And so yeah. this yeah. covers all of the digits, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> but you would still have to write parsers for numbers. Parses for all those different numbers, right? Right. So, so the, yeah, the R number, and you have a that's right. So, so the, the the real number parsers just do the Latin range of digits. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So again, the idea here is that all the Unicode support is transparent, right? You don't have to opt in at anything. You don't have to, to to tweak any knobs. You just provide Unicode input, and you get Unicode behavior. You provide ASCII input, you get ASCII behavior. Um, and at base, I wanted to not lose the ability to just say like, I don't care about Unicode, I just want to do ASCII. Because what I find is that if people have a Unicode API and a non-Unicode API, when they don't know anything about it, it's intimidating, they just don't use it. But if you make them the same API and unify it, then they get the nice benefits of having the support for Unicode if they decide they need it later with no rewrites. Okay, so let's talk about diagnostics. So there's a couple of different kinds of um, sort of error reporting that are interesting. This one is the user facing one. Okay, so this is, uh, the idea is you do a parse, something failed, you wanna produce some output that someone who wrote the input can use to fix their input. Okay, later on we're gonna talk about more like debugging tools that are for us when we're writing parsers. <clears throat> so, diagnostics come from expectation points. This is something I mentioned before when we were talking about the set of operator overloads. Again, this is like, you know, pretty similar to what you'd want for a, a string uh, literal parser, except that you'd want Lexeme around this. But the point is that if I see an open quote, I may or may not have characters here, right? There's zero or more characters allowed. But as soon as I've seen the open quote and whatever characters are found in the middle, I have to see a close quote. The reason I, I wrote it this way, this, so this turns off backtracking. This says, if there's not a quote right here, I get a hard error and it fails the entire top level parse. The reason that's important is that um, if I don't know where to communicate to the user that there's a failure, I don't know what to put in the output message. And I don't even know where I've reached an actual real failure that I should report to anyone because we have this infinite look at it, and that means infinite um, backtracking. So there's no point in the parse where I can say, nope, this is wrong, because there's always some other alternative, unless I have some global knowledge of where the failures are. That global knowledge has to come from the, the writer of the parser, and they communicate that with this. So in this case, that means that there is no other parser that might be part of an alternative elsewhere in the higher level parse, where I could start with a quote, and then have something that's not a quote follow it. That's what this means. Like if I ever come to this part of the parse where this parser is in play and I see an open quote is a hard error not to close the quote or not to close the string. Okay, that's really common in many, many uh, parsers you're gonna write that an open quote must be followed by a closed quote. And the same thing you would have with like, you know, matched angle brackets, matched square braces, whatever. <clears throat> so let's think, uh, about a JSON example for a second. So this is um, so there's a there's a pretty uh, long JSON extended example in the online documentation. So using that, if I feed it this input, right, we've, we're missing a, a closed square brace right there. This is the actual output that it produces. So it quotes the line. It knows the name of the file if you give it the name of the file. Um, it quotes the line. It says colon line number colon um, column colon error colon expected the exact piece of markup it expected, right? And then it quotes the line and it puts a carrot pointing right to the offending character, okay? So this is, you know, I took this from obviously like Clang and then GCC started doing error messages like this and it's very nice. <clears throat> if you're using a typical editor, they're used to expecting error messages from those compilers. And so you can often, like if I'm in Emacs, I can click on that line, it'll, it'll load that file and take me to it. It's very nice, right? So I can immediately navigate to where the problem is. 
I did the same kind of thing in Spirit 2, but it was a lot of code and it took me a long time to get it right. So they give you all the information, but it's in a very inconvenient format. I didn't have to write a single line of code in the parser, the JSON parser that I wrote. The library itself does this and knows how to do it. Okay, so this is just built-in behavior. All the pieces here that were used to generate this are customizable. So um, you can uh, replace the default error handler with an error handler that does some different format or produces different kind of output or produces like, you know, info lines that correlate with the, the actual error that you've got or whatever, okay? So the way I've done it, so does this be sugar into something like pause quote alternate failing parser with an action or something that throws like because that's how i've done it if you're if you're talking about like, the throwing um being does it use a parser that always fails is it composed at that level or does it kind of is this just the greater than operator is specially written to do this it's special so yeah it doesn't, de it, it doesn't so what this do what this does is this produces a sequence parser with three parsers in it mm -hmm. This parser has a, a, lit, a lit parser of that character, this uh, repeat right. parser and lit car, uh, parser there. And then there is actually like part of the sequence parser template parameters, there is a, um, uh, a type list essentially that has a true or false for whether or not each, um, each element is allowed to fail. Like basically it says like, is there an expectation point before this one, this one, or this one, right? And so it would be, you know, false, false, true for this one. And that's all it is. So it's explicitly written in that way. There's not like a, a fail parser um, that you combine with other things. Yeah, um, there is. Um, I was actually thinking of maybe making, there's a thing called an expectation parser, but that uses like the ampersand and the bang. Uh, and that just makes like basically a, a, a look ahead or neg negated look ahead. Um, but there is, I would considered maybe like, so for instance, if you wanted to put, for whatever reason, you know what this part of the parse, this parser had damn well better match, but you don't have a convenient place to put the single greater than before this one. So you might want to put like an expectation point right here, like around this, say like this thing is expected to fail. So I'd consider doing that, but I didn't have any concrete use cases for it. Every place I could think of where I would want to write that, this would have been the alternative of something, and then I would have just, or um, a sequence of something, and I would have written it right before this parser's use. So. <clears throat> but to do this, you said that you have to use another function that is not parse. Because another you function is not parse. Because you location of the error. Uh, you said parse returns an optional, so. Yeah, but, but um, it records the location at the point of failure and then throws an exception that includes that information, that goes back to the top. That information is in the pointer you pass? Uh, the, not the, the pointer, failure. it's it's included in the exception that gets thrown at the point of failure. But who does that? The boost parser or boost shades or the shades on uh, uh, no boost parser does that. Okay. Yeah. That's all like I said, like oh, this so output break it down gives an exception directly. Yes. Oh, okay. I yes. missed that. Yeah, yeah. With the with the location and everything. Right, right. Well, that's very useful. Do you have yeah. a way to run this uh, library without exceptions? Uh, no, because you need that to report that particular kind of failure. I could have, um, you know, done some kind of expected pattern or something like that, but I I just but prefer I, exceptions. I think Spirit gave you that information in the iterator you pass, and then you have yeah. to recover everything. That's right. So exactly. So iterate. I mean, so Spirit expected you to at the point of failure produce the diagnostic yourself, and it would give you the pieces. But then, like quoting the yes, line yes, became yes. difficult because you'd have to like reverse a little ways and figure out where the beginning of the line was. It was all very complicated. Count character. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> okay. So again, because we have infinite look ahead and infinite backtracking, that means that we don't have a way to produce a diagnostic that says this is the place that needs correcting to fix your parse without expectation points, right? Because so imagine we've got A or B or C, okay? We parse A, it fails. Okay, that's fine. We'll parse B, that fails. Now we're going to parse C. We might think, okay, now I can produce a diagnostic saying C failed. So this or parser, this alternative parser, the whole thing failed. There's a problem in here somewhere. The problem is I don't know whether the A, B, or C failure was the most salient one to report to the user. I don't know where to point to. I don't know what the markup was that they should have put that makes it make sense. 
But the bigger problem is, what if this whole A or B or C was part of an alternative of a higher level parser and having it fail is fine because then you just try the next alternative of the higher level parser. So essentially you need that global information. Another approach that someone recommended to me was, what if you try to go the farthest you can, you keep a count of the farthest progress you've made, right? And then whenever you fail the whole parse globally, you report, this is the farthest we made it. But again, what if you have like some kind of, you know, sequence of delimited somethings and you parse very, very far into that, but it doesn't have a little thing it needs at the end. So you backtrack and then there's some other parser you try after that. Is it important that we got really far in that one? Like if, if I was to, to add the thing that it was supposed to terminate with that was missing, would that fix the parse or was it actually related to something earlier that went wrong? It's, it's essentially impossible to know. Um, without the user telling you from their parser structure where the failure points are, right? Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask something similar. <clears throat> like, instead of having an expectation point that fails, could you have one that pretends like it passed the, the pretends like the parser succeeded and carry on, so that you have a, a fix up to suggest if the parser then succeeds overall? Uh, yeah, that's interesting, huh? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, maybe. But I mean, I, I kind of think like the expectation could be like uh, with an or, with an uh, alternative, where you <coughs> where you take the alternative and then make some diagnostic message that's on. Yeah. So if you put expectation and then parenthesized a or b, yeah. then the message would say instead of saying like you need to put a close bracket here in quotes, it would say I expected a or b here. <laughs> it would write literally A bar B um, with spacing. And then if A and B had names, it would put the names instead of the, the parser itself. So if they were rules, it would put the names of the, they would put the text for the rules. So it would say, I expected something in quotes, bar something in quotes. And it's, it's just not very user friendly. It's not end user friendly, it's programmer friendly. Yeah. So this might be really yeah. useful because <clears throat> typically parsing these things, like if you encounter an error, it's gonna be scoped to like, yeah. Because you're passing like JSON, that error goes away as soon as you hit the closing yeah. curly, and then yeah. the rest of it would succeed probably. So if you think about like the semicolon diagnostic they give you after a struct definition right. in C++, if you look inside the GCC implementation, it actually has a big note that says like, I know we just reached the end of the struct and there's the close curly, but we can't expect a semicolon here because of all the shit that could come after. So we have to like parse a really long time. There's like pages and pages of code. And then finally it says like, okay, now we know there must have been a sure. missing semicolon, right? Oh, because you could have a variable <coughs> declaration right there before the semicolon. Exactly. Anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, and there's, it turns out there's a whole bunch of stuff that yeah. can go there yeah. too. Yeah. So what you essentially have to do, I think, to make that kind of behavior, and that's similar to what you're asking well, for. Well, but the question, I mean, that's C++, and C++ is horrible to parse. But well, sure. Most but most people are using this as a YAML or JSON, right? Yeah, well, YAML's also hard, horrible to parse, but, but sure, JSON is, a, is an easier example. But for JSON, like, the number of places where you can have a hard failure is embarrassingly easy to detect. I think what you're thinking of is a case, if I understood you correctly, it's a case of like, oh, I parsed a bit of stuff, and then, I've got something at the end and I don't know if I've actually failed yet and I want to produce some kind of information. So the way that I would do that, and we're going to see an example of this actually, is I would mark that spot, keep going a little ways, and then find some other important information yeah. and, and produce a diagnostic myself as part of the parser. And well, there's so, mechanism yeah. for that. Uh, so I'm saying that most same grammars, <clears throat> errors can be compartmentalized to the scope of the declaration they're in yeah. or something. And right. after that, you'll you're parsing fine again. Uh, yeah, so, right. So. That's that's true enough. Yeah, yeah. That's true. So if you want to make an expectation parser that failed, what you would do is you would hang um, a semantic action. You would say, well, let me just show the code again. You would say um, regular uh, shift, mm -hmm. that bar epsilon, and then you'd have a semantic action that produced a, a warning, okay. yeah. right? Or like, hey, by the way, this failed, but I'm gonna keep going. Right. Yeah. Cool. You okay. What is eps <clears throat> epsilon is the thing that uh, always matches, but never consumes any input. So it's okay. the it's the zero length parsing. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so as I just said, you can produce your own error messages, right? Or you can also produce warnings. I think there's another level that I called like uh, info or 
something something like that. But the idea is, let's say um, this is an example of Tobias gave earlier that what if you have an open tag and you want a matching close tag, right? So you'd save the name of the open tag when you parse it in some scratch space. And then when you parse the closing tag, it needs to have the general shape of a close tag, but then the actual token inside the close tag needs to match the thing the same as the open tag for that to be a, a, a correct match. Like so what you would do, thing. what's that? Like a raw string. Yeah, and a raw string literal, uh, XML, HTML, these kind of things, right? So what you would do in that case is you would say, um, because I recorded the first location, what I can do is I can produce an error message that says, hey, this failed to parse, and by the way, here's the previous line where the open tag was, and here's what it was, and it doesn't, it failed to parse because it didn't match that thing, okay? And then you can just throw the error message uh, the, the error exception that you get, uh, which doesn't produce a diagnostic, and there's a way to do that, right? So you have full control over that kind of error reporting. The default, I think, is the right thing, but like sometimes you need more information, and it's really useful for that. When, when you say implement your own warnings, you mean like accumulating them <coughs> somewhere or printing them to screen? What you're doing well, that, so that's the thing. So you have um, an error handler that by default prints out the std error. Yeah but you can configure it to um, uh, write to a certain stream that you give it. So you can log those or you can just uh, put them in a, a string stream or whatever you want to do with them. So they go wherever you want to put them, but by default, they go to Stadera. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I already talked about that. Let's talk about trace. So <clears throat> often in a very complicated parser, again, the YAML parser is the, the great example that I found this really to be useful. And I had some cases of the YAML test that would fail. And it was very hard to look at the parser and look at the YAML grammar and figure out where the problem was. Turning on trace is what allowed me to find a lot of those problems because you get very verbose action. Like we're entering this parser, we're at this point of the input. Now we're entering this part of the sub parser within that parser and we're still at this place of the input and so on. And then you get to see like, what attributes are generated, whether the parse succeed or failed, and all the alternatives and the order in which they're, they're attempted. Okay, so in order to turn on trace, there is a parameter that I've not been showing because it defaults to trace off, but you can just put trace off at the end of any of these calls to parse or prefix parse that I've shown you so far. And that turns on trace. So um, Spirit had a way of doing this, but everything had to use the stream insertion operator. If you didn't have that and trace was turned on, if any of your attributes was not streamable, it failed to parse. What I do is I just detect if, if that's well formed and I just produce like unprintable. Uh, and that's, that's all I say for that, right? So it's very, very uh, sort of ergonomic, uh, even for things that you don't necessarily uh, want to print out. And uh, it can also be like a runtime property. You don't have to turn it on uh, and recompile. Okay, so this is an example of trace that we get. So it's useful to look at the back first. So this is the actual input. This is where we are in the input right now. If there's more input, it would probably have an ellipsis or maybe it just shows the first few characters. I forget exactly how it's formatted. But every single parser knows how to print itself. Okay, that's part of the parsing requirement. So when you add a new parser, if you, if you immediately try to write a test for that parser, the first thing you're gonna get is, hey, I don't know how to print this parser. So you have to write an overload of print uh, detailed print to, to print the parser. So what this is doing is we're parsing that input and we're starting at this parser right here. So what we're doing is there's a, there's a limit of depth of how much structure it'll show in the parser. So here we see like there's a raw directive inside of that there's a Lexeme directive and inside of that there's some sequence parser and I've just got an ellipsis there and I'm just showing you that, hey, there's a sequence parser. It doesn't matter what the bits are exactly, right? <clears throat> Then once we go down into the Lexeme parser inside of the raw, now we're only two levels deep to show this thing, but now it's kind of also too long, right? So we, we quote again, part of it. Then we go down inside the Lexeme parser to this sequence parser here. Um, I think it's actually an alternative of sequences, but anyway, we, we have this alternative of sequences. And the first thing we do is try to evaluate this first sub parser here, uh, the first element of the first sequence and the alternative and then we see begin go down here. So we just recursively descent through the, the various um, bits of the parser until we get to an actual first order parser. And then we try to apply that to the input. In this case, this first order parser says, I match a dash, an N is not a dash, the beginning of the input's an N. So that fails. We produce no match and then we have a matching N to show us that we're coming out of this recursive descent. If this had matched, the actual attribute would be right there, okay? So for a variant, uh, variants are kind of fiddly to deal with, so I just produce 
variant <laughs> and for unprintable or produce unprintable, everything else I actually print it. If there's a stream insertion operator for it, I just use that, okay? Um, and then <clears throat> you can see like, this is the actual parser that was applied here where we got no match, but because this is an alternative parser with the minus, this whole thing is a match, right? Um, but it has no attribute, right? So, oh, I, I'm sorry, I pointed to this line. I meant to point in here, the attribute would have been here, but this, this has no match and this has matched, no input, and this is the attribute that we got, which is none, okay? Yeah. Sorry, how do you report this trace? Is it in the result of the part? Uh, no, this just gets spit out to Stutz, uh, Stutzy app. Or um, ah, so is it Stut yeah, yeah, it gets print to stud out. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Um, again, this is just a trace facility. This is just for debugging. Right. So this is only intended for your eyes. It's not something you should leave turned on. And if you use uh, somewhere like the greater than, it will tell you or no match throw or something. It will break somewhere. Um, yeah. So if you got to the point where you had a failed expectation, it would be the last thing you saw. And I think it would just kind of stop the... Thing. And you, you would see from the top level that there was some output and stood out or stood stood error uh, that had the um, failure in it. Yeah. Okay. So that was one kind of debugging support trace, but I'm talking about explicit debugging support where I'm doing something uh, kind of weird. <laughs> Let's talk about the weird thing I'm doing. Usually in C++, we try to catch every error we can as early as we can. That means catching everything during compile instead of catching it during run, okay? What happens with Spirit when you write the wrong code is you get pages and pages and pages of template instantiation stack so that the, 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 the mode for writing Spirit 2 parsers is you write a little bit, you compile, write a little bit, you compile, write a little bit. <laughs> like you're, you're writing like tokens at a time sometimes to try like, no, that didn't work. Let me, let me rejigger things. Because you're just, you've given up on trying to read that stuff. Like you can make sense of it. It's just gonna take you way too long. It's gonna take you forever to do that, okay? So I was at a point where I was having one of these kinds of failures and I was like, it's telling me that this semantic action is ill-formed, but I don't know where the semantic action is applied to because I'm applying it to all these different places. Which one is the problem? I can't tell. So I thought, well, what if I was able to put that line where that semantic action is failing? What if I was to make it well-formed just to get to the point where I could look at a debugger and set a breakpoint there? And as soon as I did that, I found my problem in like a few seconds in the debugger by just setting a breakpoint in that spot and running it. And then it, it would just magically worked. <laughs> so counterintuitively by making a whole bunch of crazy, stupid, ill-formed code well-formed, you get a better debugging experience. Uh, and I'll explain more in detail how this works. I, bear with me. I know that sounds like a dumb thing to do, but it, it's really nice. Okay. So the way we do this is we have this special type called nope. Okay. So nope is the internal representation of a none. Okay. So none is the user facing, I don't have an attribute type. Nope is the I don't know, I don't care type used internally within a library, okay? A nope is what I call promiscuous type. It converts to anything from anything. It has all the operator overloads, right? We try to make it well-formed in as many contexts as possible. So it just, it just does whatever, but all the implementations of all those overloads, all those uh, conversions is an assert, okay? So we make the code well-formed and then assert. So you just run your code. Sometimes all you have to do is, um, declare your um, your uh, parser type and then put it in a unit test where like the declaration is just there and it's like when you run the code <laughs> that initializes everything, it asserts on you. And so that it can be a form of unit test to just have the parser in a, in a file and, and compile it and run it. Okay, so this is the class of bugs that it helps with. Okay, so let's say we have this assign um, lambda that we're gonna use. So again, we take, uh, a reference to the context, after of context we've seen before. That says, I've got a parser that just matched. That means I run this semantic action for that parser. Its attribute is this attribute, okay? We have a different name for the attribute of the rule that you're in. So rules have associated parsers. Those parsers can have subparsers. You can have a semantic action anywhere in there, okay? Any of those semantic actions knows how to get to the semantic or the uh, attribute of the rule that it's in 
by using val instead of adger. Okay, so this is really common code to write. I've got a rule, it's got several alternatives. For each of the alternatives, I either take the attribute and assign it directly to the attribute of the rule, like this is how we got the value of our rule, is this parser worked, or there's some function of the attribute that I assign to the, uh, to the um, um, rule attribute and that works, okay? So, because this is a common pattern, I might write this, attach it to this parser, and everything's fine right now, but if I use this parser outside of a rule, this returns a nope, okay? It doesn't know what the type is. Um, so if I left the code ill-formed, it would be a hard error. And then everywhere you used a sign, you'd have to look at, is this um, use of a sign well-formed? And again, I don't see a rule anywhere here. So I'd have to look at where this parser is used in addition. So it becomes very hard to figure out just inspecting the code where the problem is. But if I make this return a nope, and this assignment is well formed, but then I get an, uh, uh, an assert, then I find this very, very quickly running the, uh, running the code, okay? So this kind of error is super pernicious because that kind of very simple assign is the kind of semantic action you write once and then use it in like 15 places in your code. And then if you have a failure, you have to look at like 15 different places maybe uses of those places to try to find it versus just looking at a single line in your in your failing uh, run. Yeah. Can you somehow use a new warning pragma to, to make a, an output to compilation? Um, so the warning, because it's the pragma, I don't think, so what I'd like to do is say like, if I instantiate this template, yeah. then I get the warning. I don't think I can do that. I think the warning happens whenever it reaches that because of preprocessor thing. So, okay, so we need a static warning instead of static yeah, asserts. Yeah, right. If I had something like that, I would use that instead perhaps, yeah. Static assert tribal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that kind of bug is super easy to write, right? Because you, you are, again, with the code we just saw, you're like you're writing the semantic action, you're attaching it to a parser with the expectation the parser will be used inside a rule, and then somewhere under maintenance, you reuse that parser outside of a rule. It's just an easy mistake to make, okay? <coughs> um, so the diagnostics are a nightmare to read. It does not fix everything for sure. The other big class of error that you get with this library is somewhere in the middle of the parse, an attribute was gonna be used to fill in a generate attribute is going to be used to generate another kind of attribute and they're incompatible. When you get that kind of error message, I can't do anything about it and it's really ugly and it's awful, awful error messages and it takes a very long time to figure out what went wrong. So there's not a great story for that. I wish I had a better story for that, but I don't. It does, however, <clears throat> fix a lot of the semantic action errors that you have because inside semantic action, the number one thing you're doing that you don't know what the type of it is, is writing one of those little functions on the context. So if by making those things all nopes, we catch those kind of errors very easily. And that's all very free form code and it's very easy to write those kind of errors. Yeah. So the one question, do I have any option to, to put that off so that I, I'm sure when I compile it, I will never get a nope? Yes, okay. it, there's a macro that turns that off completely. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I think it says like, uh, yeah, I, I forget what the macro is spelled, but basically it says like, don't make my code well-formed when it doesn't belong being well-formed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, that's particularly because like, I knew there was gonna be some people who were like, I don't care if it makes things faster, that's dumb, don't do that. <laughs> so I wanted a knob to turn it off, yeah. Okay, well, maybe I wanna know if, I, if there's an error I haven't, I haven't got a test for. Yeah, actually that's a good point. So like if you haven't caught it in a run, yeah. then yeah, you wanna be able to find that out. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. So you might, even if you like the feature, you might wanna turn it off, yeah. Is the, uh, is the behavior <clears throat> of the asserts inside the notes customizable? Uh, I think I'm using uh, the moral equivalent of boost assert. And so that is a replaceable macro that you can put your own thing in, yeah. Okay, so there's one algorithm and a handful of ranges that I've added that you can use with the parsers that you make that kind of let you use them in a way that you would use a regex, right? Uh, this is kind of a use case that doesn't exist in spirit, but I, I found it attractive. So I thought I would add this. So the parse overloads, you've got parse and prefix parse. And so parse allows you to parse the entire input, prefix parse, the prefix of the input. Sometimes you wanna find something somewhere in the middle, okay? 
So there is a search algorithm that lets you do that. It does not produce an attribute. It only finds the place where the match happened, but it searches the entire input. So if, if in this case we have comma delimited integers, including a skipper, as exactly the same API, including the trace option, um, we can give it this string and it's gonna happily uh, match this part and ignore the other bits because they don't um, match the, the uh, sequence events, right? So I find that this is useful not because um, I wanna have a fully general like parse function call that like does what parse does and including producing an attribute right in the middle, but because this is kind of a different use case where I wanna do the equivalent of a regex match without having to write a regex because as they say, if you have a problem and use a regex to solve that problem, now you have two problems, right? <laughs> so I would much rather write this. This is not a, a, a write only thing. I can read this and come back to it and understand what that parser looks like much more readily than I can understand how the regex uh, works. Okay, there's also a search all range adapter. So search all, again, has the same um, set of parameters that you would pass to um, parse, except that you can leave off the, uh, the input sequence and then use the uh, pipe um, mechanism. And this does just what you would expect, right? It finds all the matches for an individual int within that same string we saw before. So in this case, it's gonna match the zero, the one, the two, et cetera. So I loop over all the subranges that I found new line after each, each match. Within the subrange, I'm gonna print out all the characters. Now these are all single characters, but this is the generalization of it. If they match multiple characters, that's what you'd have to write. Um, so this is gonna print out uh, those uh, five numbers with a new line after each, okay? In general, could yeah. matched subranges overlap? No, okay. matched subranges can overlap, yeah. So there are kind of permutations of this. So one is split. Split does just what you would think. Uh, you can give it a literal and then it just works like the stood ranges split. Um, it can also though have an arbitrary parser, okay? So you can say like, give me all the sub ranges of the input for which the parser does not match. That's what split does, okay? <clears throat> There's also replace. What replace does is it gives you a sequence, uh, a range of ranges. Each range is either the original input if it did not match the parser or it is some subrange that you gave it as a replacement wherever there was a match. Okay? So for this one, if I did uh, replace, I would put like, so I think uh, maybe put the range here. I think that's right. No, I maybe put the range here, but wherever. Somewhere you put a parameter and it's the thing to produce whenever you find one of these ints. So if I produced, um, uh, if I produce a subrange that had like n slash a for you know not applicable, I could replace each of these numbers with n a, and all the the commas and space and stuff would stay. Okay, but I, you would have to you would have to call join on that to actually get it to be like a single string. Or well, join and then you know um, what, what do we call that uh, the construct or two or whatever and make a string out of it, right? Um, but as it as it is, it's a range of ranges. Okay. But it's a, it's a range of strings, not integers. No, it's a, it's a range of... So you have to... It's a, it's a range of, of ranges of char, yeah. not exactly strings or the, or the numbers, but, but definitely not the numbers. So it is in general that you parse the, result, the, the subranges sometimes. You parse what subranges? What? You, you parse the subranges again. Let's say if you want to assign the integers, not output to screen, you have to parse the subrange, right? Um, to get the value. Well, so you're saying if I had this subrange and I wanted to get the actual zero, I yes, would parse yes. this? Yeah, yes. I could okay, do that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> again, we're dropping the actual attribute on the floor. We don't, even though this generates an, uh, an integer, yeah. we don't retain That's that. Yeah. So the other one is transform place. This one is when we actually do uh, keep the, um, the attribute generated by the, the parser that matched. But what we do is uh, instead of giving it a subrange to replace, you give it a callable that takes the attribute that the parser produces. When you find a match, you take the attribute, you feed it to the callable, whatever subrange that produces, that's what goes in the, 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 the range of ranges, okay? So this gives you like, you know, 
a contextual replacement where you're able to use the actual parsed attribute to figure out what the replacement should be, okay? And this works with our values and stuff. So you can produce like an actual string there if you want to, and it, it just, it works, okay? All right, so now we're gonna talk about a much more extended example. Um, so this is um, following the extended example in online docs. This is uh, implementing a JSON parser, yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Is there a operator overload that says, maybe I missed this, or is there an easy way to take a parser and make it produce none actually? Like yeah, you, you put oh, om omit thing. around it. Omit, that was yeah, that was the directive, yeah. Okay, so like I said, this is from the, the online docs. Empty action. So there is um, a limit in JSON of how deep you can nest um, uh, objects within lists within objects, et cetera. Uh, so we need a thing to throw if we find that condition. Uh, so that's just this... Um, uh, exception type for that. We also need some global state. And when I say global, I don't mean truly global, I mean global to the whole parse, where we're able to, inside a semantic action, say globals of context, and then get this struct, okay? Or get a reference to it. So we're gonna populate it with the max that we want. I think the minimum uh, max depth is 512, but you can configure it to be something else. And then we're going to keep a count of how deep we are that we that we go through um, as we parse. And then if we ever exceed the maximum, then we throw that exception. Okay. So the way we associate that globals object with the actual parse is this is our top level rule for a value, right? Anytime you parse JSON, you get a value. You get a double, a, a number, you get, or sorry, not a double, you get a bool or a number, or you get a, a list, et cetera. Okay, so it's always gonna be a value. So that's our top level parser. So what we do is we say, I want this globals object here. We go ahead and initialize it. I also want this particular error handler. So this is the case that you had mentioned before. You're wondering where the errors go. There's several different error handlers. And um, one of them just takes any error and just immediately rethrows it and doesn't log or do anything different. Uh, you can make one that logs using speed log or something. Um, by default, the ones that I have like have streams that you can write to. Um, and then the default one just um, spits everything out to the std error stream and, and so forth. But in this case, we want to provide a particular uh, error callback that doesn't print to std out. All this stuff for parsing JSON is within one function that we want to, to call. So we want um, that function to take the place we want this, the uh, diagnostics to go. So this is how we glue that together. We say we want this error handler, which is the callback error handler. So whenever you get a failure, you produce a string and you call the error callback for the warning or the error category. Uh, and there's a callback for each one of those, okay? So at the top level, we pass in these callbacks and we use that to construct this error handler. And so now that we have this globals and this error handler, the way we associate it with the, the parser as we call with globals, with the parser and the globals, that basically makes a copy of this with that globals set in the copy. Okay, top level parsers can have um, a global and an error handler. That parser that we get, we pass that to with error handler and do the same thing where now we set the error handler. Okay, so these are mix and match. You could do them in the other order. You could do only one of them, none of them, what have you. So this parser is what we're gonna use in our call to parse. And ultimately, it just uses this parser, this rule, except that it also knows to look into this top-level parser. And it, because it has globals and error handler associated with it, that's going to become part of the context for the whole parse. You're looking at squinty. Is it confusing? I, I'm looking at it squinty because it's const. Uh, but I guess that's OK, because you gave it a, a copy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, uh, these are held by reference. So these are pointers to these things. That's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so everything in the global context, everything in the context object is a pointer to some other place in the stack. This is just the way the whole thing is written. Yeah. We can make copies of everything, but you can have arbitrarily large things like the global state could be a gigabyte. Like I've, there's no limit to how big you can make it or where it can live. So making a, a blindly making a copy and then having knobs for like when it's a reference and when it's a non, I just made it, it's just a pointer all the time. That, that, yeah. That's fair, I get it. But in that case, that's not how I write it because 
these are kind of contextual things that then should leak out, right? Unless this is supposed to be within the function context. This is within the the the, the parse context that produces the that does the JSON parsing. Yeah, this is all. Oh, like this is like within parse JSON or whatever. Yeah, there's like a parse JSON top level function. Yeah. Okay. Good. Right. The, the, the okay. All right. Ignore you, my. Ignore if my you were thinking these were like a namespace scope or whatever, no, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be like nasty. You're making the yeah. parser. I'm like. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 <clears throat> okay. So. Uh, we've also got a little bit of state because uh, at some point we have an escape uh, sequence that we can use um, where we have like two UTF-16 surrogates escaped in the middle of a, like a quoted string. And so we need to record the first UTF-16 code unit uh, so that when we parse the next one, we can use the two of them to make a code point. So this is just a little bit of scratch space. So that locals object is gonna be used in the rule that does that kind of double escape. <laughs> And <laughs> there's a drama over the chair. Uh, <laughs> there's no drama. And then that's where it's used right there. So inside of this thing, I forget why it has this funky name. That might have come from the, the JSON um, like spec or something. But the point is that this locals here. So we've got a rule like normal that's got its tag type and the attribute type. Forget that this is not char32 t. It doesn't matter. That could be int even. Um, but the point is this other thing is specifying locals, right? So within a rule, you're allowed to have like scratch space that you associate with that rule. And that scratch space is the one we just saw right here. It's just an int, it's just a struct with an int in it, okay? So inside of a semantic action, you can say locals of context, and that'll give you this scratch space here. Any other place is gonna give you a note because the other ones don't have scratch space, okay? We only need it for that rule. All right, but you can see the general shape of the rules, right? So we've got a rule for white space. The white space has to be different from the default white space from the library because white space for uh, Unicode is only like four code points, I think. Um, the character that can happen inside of a string is this thing here. There's a bunch of somewhat nasty logic that's covered by these things here for what that, that is. Um, and then, yeah, all the rest of these are just things that can appear in a string, I'm pretty sure. Uh, oh, and this is, uh, yeah, that, I don't think that's very interesting to talk about, okay. So here's the real like meat of the parser. This is the stuff you think of when you think of JSON, right? So we've got the different alternatives for what can be in a value, like null, string, number, et cetera. Um, I do have object and array, and then I've got this special thing, object element, which is, as you can imagine, an element of an object. So that's the uh, sort of key value pairs uh, delimited by a colon. And then ultimately we have the value that is an or of these things, except for the object element. So we declare ahead of time all of our rules, and then this is kind of like having a header with all our four declarations in it, and then we're going to see the definitions. Okay, so the first definition. Yeah, yeah. is a bool missing here? Uh, well, okay, so bool uh, we don't need to write because the bool built in the library is just literal true, literal right, false. Right, okay. Yeah, so it's exactly the same. Um, okay, <clears throat> so the object element def. This is one key value parent inside of an object. Once we're inside an object, ignore this for a second, but once you're inside an object, you've already seen the open curly. So you know that when I see a string, the only thing that can come after that is colon value. So there's an expectation point before the colon. And that produces a pretty nice error message. You put a uh, uh, string, a uh, semicolon, something, it points and says, hey, that's supposed to be a colon. You hit the wrong key, right? After you see the semi, I mean, after you see the colon, then you know you have to see a value there. And if something is there that doesn't parse as a value, it'll point right after the colon and say, hey, I expected a value here. I don't know what that thing is. Doesn't match a value. Yeah. Can you put the skipper here? Because this would be the right place to put it, right? No, the skipper goes on the top level called a parse. I know, but at this point, you, you already know the skipper is, is space or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you, you definitely know that, well. You know what I mean? It's like, you, this is the skipper here. Uh, WS is the skipper. Okay, but it's separate. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a separate rule that's the skipper, but it's gonna get used in the top level. So we don't need to apply it here because the skipper works all the way down through the parse. The question, can you apply it here? Um, I mean, you can always apply a skipper. Okay, you have to write the complicated stuff. Yeah, you, I mean, you could write the skip directive and give it the skipper if you wanted to, yeah. Okay, so that is a single key value pair. And so here's how we parse an object. So the first thing we do is, that, so this underscore L, this is the UDL form of writing uh, lit one character. It's a little bit cute, but I like it. Um, and then what we need to do in here is do object init. And the reason for that is the return type for all of these parsers that produce a value is a JSON value, which is this type erased thing, 
Okay, so it's a type erasure of, there's a class for object, there's a class for list, there's a class for, um, well, I guess we don't have a class for bool, there's just a bool, but it's a type erased um, holder for any one of those things. So because of that fact, we need to actually generate like a default constructed object and jam it in there, right? So that then in here, we can reach into that object and do a single insert of a single key value pair, okay? And again, we have a sequence point before the curly brace because if you don't have a curly brace, there's no amount of backtracking that will make that parse work. So we know that's a failure point. The way we do the object in it is naively, we just do this part, right? It's very, very simple. We've got the attribute for the rule and then we just put a default constructed object in there. That's simple, right? But remember, because we have to track this maximum recursion depth, that's what most of this um, logic does, right? It just increments the thing and checks and throws if it ex exceeds the max. <clears throat> and then the object insert is really straightforward, right? Again, we get a reference to the rules attribute. This is uh, the moral equivalent of an anti-cast of a V where we, uh, we are you know, grabbing it as an object and then we do insert on that object and we do make pair here. So this is one of the places where I'm explicitly using uh, the HANA like nice um, index operator. Uh, I, I realized when I was looking at these slides the other day that like, the print could go here or here, it doesn't matter, but I wrote it differently for no apparent reason on the two uh, lines. But where this really shines is when you've got like a tuple within a tuple within a tuple or something like that and you put like bracket, bracket, bracket. If you do it with get, you end up writing three nested gets where the indices are like swizzled order with the values that are being gotten from. And it's just a nightmare. The, the bracket, bracket, bracket is much more readable. So for what where, that's worth. Where's value? Um, I think it really matters where you put the, the parentheses because you, you move you move away from the whole attribute so, and then you take well so this uh, this makes an r value reference out of this and then i take this value out that's an r value reference this takes the value out as an l value reference and that makes an r value reference is the same thing yeah but if you if it first called okay i uh, yeah yeah okay yeah that that is, because it's that 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 yeah, the yeah, correct yeah, yeah. place that's, to put move yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Those are the correct places to move. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not morally correct, but they're actually correct as opposed to every other place. Yeah. 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 On the previous slide, where value is coming from? The, the value meaning value, the attribute? No, value ampersand. Ah, okay. So this is um, so this is the JSON value oh, okay, okay. Um, type. That's our that's our holder type race type. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I you know I was trying to. It's hard to fit stuff on uh, reveal slides. It doesn't fit a lot of code vertically. And so I was trying to elide all the like sort of type erased holder parts and just concentrate on the parsing. And I know that that shed some context. So sorry about that. So list parsing does the same pattern, right? You have an open square brace, you have a single element, you have to jam like a default constructed list into your holder uh, value and then do all the inserts. And then for each of the, um, for each of the open square braces, you also have to track your depth and so on. Okay, um, and I think, wait, did I? I think I'm maybe missing something. Uh, yeah, I'm not like decrementing the depth. So that's maybe just a bug. <laughs> I think I just realized that right now. I should have something like, uh, this should be uh, underscore L and then uh, a semantic action that does the inverse of the, the depth tracking from that part, I, yeah. Like this has been in this demo for years. <laughs> You're using minus, don't you want star? So uh, why did I put a minus there? Yeah, you, you, want, you want to be able to pass the empty list. Yeah, but so the empty object is fine with a star or a minus. Yeah, I think I meant a star. Did I mean yeah. a star? I think no, I meant, I no, no, I didn't minus. mean a star. Uh, so the reason for the star, okay, these are comma delimited, okay, and the commas. Oh, that's right. Yeah, star would um, allow yeah, yeah. not comma separated. Yeah, yeah. So, so, is the so doing you, you have to have this thing first before the pairs of comma and that thing again. And so that's why you need the minus. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things I always have to think about. But wait, the, does the percent sign not start with epsilon? That's right. Oh, so you need to, that's an, an at least one. Exactly. Oh, it's that, a, it's, oh, a it's a it's a one or more right. where the yeah. ones after the first are coming. Yeah, that, that, yeah. Now, now it makes sense. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So null is um, almost trivial, right? We just want to match the actual string null, but then we want to generate the attribute of, an, of a default constructed value. Okay, that's our representation of null with the, the JSON value uh, type. And what this atter um, parser does is it's like epsilon with an attribute, right? It doesn't consume any input, it always matches, and it produces that attribute. Okay. Then we have how we define a single character that can appear in the string. So we have all these different kind of escape sequences. Uh, and then at the very end, we have uh, like, it's any code point that's not one of these. Um, the interesting part, I think, is the, um, the symbol table. So the way it works here is I can have backslash followed by one of the simple escapes in that list, okay? So whenever I see backslash, it had damn well better be followed by one of those characters. That's why it's an expectation point. When I match one of those characters, I actually have the code point corresponding there, right? So if you see backslash F, that's hex C, right? And so on. But as soon as I see a backslash, I need to see one of those other characters or um, we know the whole parse failed. And I could point a nice thing there saying expected, I don't know what I produced there. <laughs> I think this might actually have an auto-generated uh, name, which is like an or of all these things. I think it might actually say something like, it would point to this location and say expected backslash quote slash blah, 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 or T, like in plain English. I think, I think that's what I did. Um, I'd have to go look and verify that that's true. And then we got the string parser itself. So once we know what character that can appear inside the string, then this is like the de rigueur uh, string parser, they all look exactly like this, which is why I have that string parser, uh, the quoted string parser. And this is what I was referring to before about how if I had a string parser, uh, sorry, a character parser I could pass into it to say that's what has to go there and not just char underscore by default, then that would let me use this even for the Unicode case, uh, sorry, the, the JSON case. Um, because I remember when I was writing and I was like, well, it's kind of a shame I can't use this in the JSON parser. Be nice for the extended example to have an example of use, but I think I can make that change and uh, add that here. And so then putting it all together, we have the top level rules um, parser itself, which is just an or of all the alternatives, numberable, null, et cetera. So that was our extended example. Now we're gonna talk about uh, callback parsing. Okay, so callback parsing I'd alluded to before. Uh, callback parsing takes your attribute generation and says, instead of like producing a structure out of the accumulated attributes combined in whatever way imply is implied by the parsers, I'm gonna actually explicitly call a callback with each attribute as I generate it. So one of the uh, nice benefits is that you, oh, I, I guess I just described that. So um, one of the nice benefits is for testing, right? So what you can do is you can define a rule test that rule, and then part of the test is making sure it produces the right attributes, okay? <clears throat> then all of your rules get combined into your top level parse, right, whatever that looks like, and then you can provide a set of callbacks to essentially eat the output of your parser. So one of the things you can do with the output of your parser is write tests, right? So you can say like, okay, I test each, tested each rule in isolation. Now I wanna make sure that the pieces fit together when I combine those rules. And I can often write logic that makes sense uh, in terms of the callback parsers getting those results and writing them off to the side somewhere. So I, I feed some input into this parser that has the callbacks. As a side effect through the callbacks, I'm generating some data and then I, I assert on all the, the values of the data are correctly you know, what I expect them to be, right? Then <clears throat> you don't touch anything. You just change the shim, the set of callbacks to apply to your actual business logic that, that consumes the result of the parse, okay? I first encountered this looking at the, uh, the Adobe ASL library. They were doing this for their parser. So their, their parser produces um, either an Atom sheet or a, an, an Eve layout. Um, and these are these two mini languages they have, and they have a, a parser framework that does both of these. 
And for each one of those parsers, they just have uh, this shim layer, which is a bunch of like basically uh, stood functions, right? And you just uh, overwrite the stood functions with whatever the action is that you want to take with that part of the parse. So it produces some part of the parse, you take some action, they're using that to test their code, and they're also using that in the production end of things that's consuming the result. It's a very, very nice design. <clears throat> so this allows you to have pretty much complete isolation of your, um, your parser itself and the testing thereof. And, and we all know like reducing combinatorial complexity and parsing is essentially good te test coverage, right? And so this is one of the ways that you can get better test coverage by having to write fewer cases. So the way you would do that, so the, there's, like I said, there's an extended uh, JSON parser. There's also an extended callback JSON parser uh, in the online docs. So this is how you would change the JSON parser. All you have to do is put callback underscore in front of rule, that's it. So what this ends up doing is the callback signature for this rule is I just pass a null tag. The callback signature for this rule is I pass the bool tag and bool and so forth. I pass the string tag and string, number tag and double. Those callbacks produce their attributes by calling those overloads that way. So you can actually have two callback rules that produce the same type, but with different tags, and they disambiguate based on the tag. So if you provide this set of JSON callbacks, so this is actually another nice use case. If you want to have, let's say, um, you parse this stuff and you want to record the results of the parse somewhere. You don't want to tie it to the business logic. You don't want to tie it to the, to the tests. You just want to spit out the results somewhere. Then you would have something that like, you know, prints out some output or does a pretty print or translates it to some other format or something. Yeah. So you, when you were defining the tags, you just declared them, right? Yeah, yeah. And this requires those to be, to be complete, complete types. types. Yeah, elsewhere I actually define them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, you just need to bother to define them somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, so I could have done, so what happens in the, the parse rule function is I take the tags by pointer so they can be incomplete if you like. They have to be complete here because I wrote it that way. I could have taken a pointer to them. It feels really wonky to pass a pointer to an incomplete type as like just a thing in user code. So I, I just said, just make it a complete tag. Type. A reference, yeah. We sure we yeah. solve this by passing in place type T. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. Uh, so I yeah. So I want to announce that the time is already there and oh. uh, we will let the speaker to finish. But uh, if you want to go, you can feel free to go. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, we are pretty close. Okay, so I already mentioned this. Uh, also callback parsing is just nice because a sax parser versus a DOM parser breaks up the parse into a smaller chunks. So if, if the whole representation of the result of your parse won't fit in memory, this is how you break it up. So. We're essentially at the end of the slides right now. There's one other thing I want to mention, which is that there's a little bit of future work um, that I want to do in the library, and these are all optimization things. One of them is, I don't know if you know the term pack rat parser, but in, in peg parsers, you can make a pack rat parser by essentially taking uh, high level rules, and whenever you parse one of them successfully, you cache the position and the attribute and the endpoint of that successful parse. So if later on there's a failure and you do backtracking, if you come back to that same place as part of another alternative and try to parse that same thing again, you're like, nope, I already know the attribute for that. I already know where to skip ahead to, to, par to parse over it. So it's a nice optimization. It really only works if you do lots of things that are like, well, I've got this thing and then a, um, a prefix of that and a prefix of that. So I have to have them in the reverse order. And so eventually I end up hitting the things twice. I'm not sure how much of a gain it is. Um, the other thing is uh, Peter Dimov noted that we're spending a whole lot of time if you look at the profiler in the omit directive, mm -hmm. for which is an explicit parser. And so if I made omitting attributes a template parameter to a parser, or even a runtime parameter, I could probably like collapse down a lot of that stuff. So there's a couple of optimi optimization things I'm looking at. Um, but otherwise, I feel like the library is, is uh, you know, pretty much done. I've had a couple of interesting suggestions in this talk that I'm probably gonna, gonna uh, implement. But, now we're open for questions. You seem to go first. Uh, no, never mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, do the operator overloads also have well-named functions if I want to use those? Like, they I'd like to say separated by instead of percent, for instance. 
Yeah, they don't. They don't. Okay. I could I could add those. Uh, you could, could probably add them. those. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't have those. But <clears throat> yeah, um, this is going to be. Is there any value to this library or it, to the components of this library if I want to use input that doesn't map to characters in any form? I mean, so this is something that we were just talking about the break, Jeff and I. That so one thing that Spirit Two would do is it would allow you to parse whatever. User events. It's fully fully generic, right? So you could par parse tokens that come out of the uh, part of the uh, uh, Spirit Lex uh, Lex Lexer, mm -hmm. another Lexer that's a third party Lexer or whatever. Um, you can also parse uh, binary, so I think you can even fit, uh, feed it stood bytes. I just support char and char thirty two T, and that's it. Mm -hmm. I think a generalization is possible. I'm not sure how much work it would be. And if it's not a, an egregious amount of work, I might just do it um, because I think it's fun. I, I, I used to like writing Spirit 2 parsers using the Lex and then having the parser be a separate stage. Um, so that, that might be something I do. But right now it only supports those two things. So before we get to you, I think you, you, so, you were first. Oh, we're, someone had a question over here before? No? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So if you have, let's say, a crappy parser that you wrote already with IO streams, mm -hmm. Okay. Can you integrate this into, into the, the middle of your, your parser here? Well, so search inside that? of a semantic action, you can just do whatever you want. Right. And I've actually written, I've actually written parsers, including I think I did this maybe in the JSON parser at some point, where I I know, I know the boundaries right. yes. of the things I want, and I just want to grab that that section, and then I want to actually parse it using some other thing that I've got that parses. So, yeah, you can do things like and that. You and you search for that. Uh, yeah, that sure. Search. Yeah, yeah. Where do you draw the line between combinators and algorithms? Because it feels like some of the algorithms are very close to being able to expressible to being expressed in combinators, but but maybe they're compensating for a lack of combinator. So um, if you look at if you look at the implementation, so like search is really simple. Like so, search is just you take the parser, you wrap it in omit, and then right, you you exactly. you basically say char uh, star yeah. of char minus that omit parser. Or a, a star or well, yeah, well, but the way I spell that is like right. char minus that omitted parser, all that in star. So I just eat characters until I start to match. Right. And then I keep going into the match. And as soon as I fail, I know I go back and, you know, eat another character. And then eventually I parse the whole thing. And the same way with search all, it does the same. So you basically are there. Search all is just a nice package for it. But the other ones are doing funky, funky things. <laughs> with like making sure that like the replacement range is a common a common range and not a like um not a iterator sentinel pair uh it has to make sure that the utf uh the flavors of utf match each other it does a lot of stuff in the adaptation phase so a lot of what those are doing is like very simple in terms of like the logic of what's happening but all the machinery that makes it this like graceful interface is really, really hairy. So I, that's kind of why I wrote them that way as separate things, because they're doing a lot of work that makes it possible for you to use them in more cases without having to do any work. Like it's, it's work that obviously has to happen, but it doesn't have to happen by you. The library can do it. And, uh, if I were to put that in the combinator stuff, I don't think it would really work. But if you look at the core of how the combinators are used, it's really like very simple applications of the existing combinators. Yeah. It, it feels like the, the sequencing combinator wants to be a fold. Because I'm thinking about use cases yeah. like, how do you, so you've got an in parser, but how do you parser an integer with separators in it? Like, yeah. that's a sequence that you want to fold into an int, right? Right, right. Yeah, so, I mean, the way you would implement that is do, like, within a lexeme, parse a bunch of individual ints, and especially if you knew the maximum number, yeah, yeah, and if you knew the maximum number of um, digits, because let's say you had a, a comma or a period, like, thousand separator, you would say, like, parse at most three digits and then separator three digits, separator three digits. Right. Right. What about like underscore separator? If we go anywhere. Uh, sure, right. But I'm saying whatever the separator is, if you knew it was it was uh, digits or a certain number of digits, then you could sort of bake that in. But the point is you would just parse all these integers and then you would take the set of them and then you would just do, you know, times a thousand, times a thousand, and then jam them together. So I mean right. you could do it like that, 
but it's just a lot of work. Um, if you were able to... Right, but that last part is a fold over the sequence. Yes. And putting together a vector is also a fold over a sequence. Yeah. Like it feels like there's a more fundamental combinator there. Yeah, that may very, be, very well be. I haven't run into enough cases like that where I've reached for that. And so I think when I do, I will probably be writing something like that if, if it makes sense. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, that's a good idea. All right. Um, I, I had a couple of clarifying questions about the Unicode slide with mm -hmm. the O with circumflex. Yeah. Um, so it, it started out, it had the um, the character parser and it had like a UTF-32 or a, a char-32T literal mm -hmm. that was O with circum, circumflex. So first off, that has to be um, the O with circumflex character as opposed to an O in combining circumflex. That's right. right. Um, yeah. And so then uh, separately, you had like the, the char example that was being parsed and the uh, char 32t, the, the char string being parsed and the char 32t string that was being parsed. So the char 32t string, because there's no normalization, if it's O and combining circumflex, it doesn't match. Yeah, no, that's true. I, I, I just said the wrong thing, though. Essentially, the, the slide was correct. I just said the wrong thing, but that's a good point. Yeah, what I should have said was um, basically the O with combining circumflex is two code units, but it is the combined character. Yeah, for, for it to match that other one it has to be, that's right. Um, yeah. and, and the reason that the char is in, the, the char string doesn't match, doesn't have to do with normalization. It's just because like, it's comparing like the individual eight bit code unit of whatever encoding char is encoding exactly. with the 32 bit and it's finding them not to be equal. Exactly, okay. yeah, that's right, yeah, okay. Are we it for questions? Or have you thought about implementing a generator library? No, no, I have not. I mean, I know that um, Karma is exists and people do useful stuff with it. I never once used it, so it's not something I know about or I'm comfortable with or really want to implement. So yeah, it's probably a completely different piece. Yeah, it's pretty different. Yeah. So it's never useful to transform a parser into a generator, so you can go back and forth. Well, it's actually, so to enforce the output as well. Right? Yeah. So, so the problem though is that uh, Karma and uh, Chi are different. Um, and they have to be different. As I asked Hartman, like, why can't you just make one grammar and have it do the input and output? But it doesn't. It doesn't work that way in Spirit either, right? Like, there's there's not a way to deterministically from the parser generate the generator or from the generator generate the parser. So, um, you basically have to write everything twice. So, so having written an actual generator as opposed to a nice BSL uh, generate. Like parsing is the easy bit. Like the, the generation <laughs> is really complicated because builders suck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Builders. Like if you've ever used protobuf or something yeah. like that, builders really suck, and you really need to be flexible on the input to like support out of order uh, insertion into the final text, mm. and and rendering is like hard. Basically, if you want to do it in any kind of efficient manner, if you don't care about efficiency, then everything. Is. <laughs> but, um, if you don't care about efficiency, you write it in prologue. <laughs> you're gonna get it yeah. All right. Well, I guess that's it. Thanks, everybody.